Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to our webinar about gardening for beneficial insects with Dr. Ed Spivak. My name is Brooke Widmar. I work for the Missouri Prairie Foundation and I wanna thank you for joining us for this Grow Native webinar, one of the last of our fall series. Uh, make sure you check out the last two for 2020, a free webinar on happy, healthy habitats and a masterclass on grassland invasive plant management. For today's webinar, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section or the chat section. Um, and when Ed is done presenting, Carol will, uh, will come on and ask him your questions for the last half of the presentation. Um, so this presentation is being recorded and tomorrow you'll receive an email with the YouTube link and any other resources mentioned in today's session. Um, so to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ed Spivak works for the St. Louis Zoo as the curator of invertebrates and is the director of the Center for Native Pollinator Conservation. Dr. Spivak has dedicated the last 40 years of his career to the conservation of invertebrates and vertebrates, working in zoos and aquariums as a zoo curator and small population biologist. He is engaged with a whole list of statewide and national committees and organizations related to butterflies, bees, and other pollinators, and is just a wealth of knowledge on the topic. So without further ado, let's get to the presentation. So take it away, Ed. Thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Carol, and Missouri Prayer Foundation for letting me talk to you today about beneficial insects. For some of you who have heard me speak before, I'll talk a lot about native bees. I will touch on them, but I really want to focus a lot on the other unsung heroes in the garden. But I first want to start with a land acknowledgement. We have been doing this because of, uh, in particular, uh, our native foods, native peoples, native pollinators program but it also recognizes the people that came before us. So we would like to acknowledge that the St. Louis Zoo is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Osage Nation and the Illini Confederacy. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. It familiarizes visitors with the cultures and histories of Missouri's indigenous tribes, as well as with their ties in the St. Louis region. We honor our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. And regarding that stewardship, we're going to talk about our friends, our friends in the garden. So who are our friends? There are a lot of them, and we're going to really focus on the insects as those friends. So for example, in this simple image, there are wasps, beetles, flies, moths, bees, and butterflies. And those friends that we have in the garden provide a lot of services for us. Those are what are termed ecosystem services. And they do a lot of things. So when we're looking at pollination, we're looking at soil health, we're looking at you know, the overall diversity in the garden, which supports a lot of other species. So those ecosystem services, which we tend to take for granted because we don't pay for them outright, but without them, we really could not survive. So the services, particularly the insect provide us, pollination, of course, biological control of various pests and others, decomposition and food web. And we're specifically gonna focus on pollination and biological control in this particular talk. So when we think about those friends, they are biological assistants. Uh, we can also kind of think of them as many livestock that we manage and help to manage in the gardens. And we look at them as three different groups, uh, the three Ps as it were, pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. And I'll go through each of these different groups and some of the representatives we find in the garden and then talk about how we can actually help these animals, which are then gonna help us in our gardens or on our farms. So first off, pollinators. Insect pollinators are keystone species. More than 90% of flowering plants, it's about 400,000 species, require an insect to move pollen from the male portions of the plant to the female portions of the plant. Besides the plants getting the services from them, we also depend upon pollinators. 75% of our crop species worldwide require pollinators, most of those being bees. Over $29 billion of our crops in the US depend upon honeybees and native bees. And I say more than 29 billion because that value is really just the value of the produce itself. So for example, tomatoes. There's the value of the tomatoes after pollination. 
But now you look at everything you can produce from, from tomatoes, whether it be tomato juice, spaghetti sauce, putting on a hamburger, every hamburger joint, every pizza place increases drastically the value of those tomatoes. Worldwide, upwards of $577 billion. And from just a personal point of view, think about it, there's about one out of every three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume depends upon pollinators. Now, why three quarters of our crops, but only one third of our food is because most of our diet is made up by bulk weed or wind pollinated uh, crops, such as corn, rice, wheat, barley, and oats. Now you can live on that to some extent, um, not very healthily in the long term, but if you really care about color, nutrition, flavor, then you really start thinking about those pollinators and particularly those native bees. Now why bees are important is because unlike other pollinators, they actively collect pollen. This is the food that they feed their offspring. It's the, the fats, the proteins, the minerals, the vitamins that they're feeding their offspring. They also show it's called flower constancy, which means that if a bee is going to a goldenrod flower, it will go to a goldenrod flower to a goldenrod, it'll go aster, aster, aster. So by doing that, it serves much more effectively as a pollinator for the plant. And then also for some types of bees, they're very specialized on only particular types of pollen. Now, when we talk about bees, we often, or many people, think about this. This is the non-native European honeybee. It was first introduced around 1621 into North America. It is an exotic. Uh, there are some concerns nowadays. We had a, an early question. I just want to point out we can talk about it later too, but honeybees being a non-native species, uh, there are concerns that they may be competing with some of our native bees particularly where we put many, many hives. Oftentimes when people come to me and they're, they're concerned about uh, bee conservation, but all they really know or think about are honeybees, and they say they want to get into beekeeping, I actually tell them, you know, no, unless you really like honeybees, you like uh, honey, um, and also if you like working with bees, it really doesn't serve a purpose because honeybees are not in danger, or commercial beekeepers may be. But where we have really ephemeral resources or limited resources and flowers, honeybees can be a problem. And there are certain places we're finding more and more, particularly in desert environments where flowers are only blooming, particularly after monsoons or rains, or areas where there's just not enough floral resources and people put a lot of honeybees. It's really about habitat. We really need to make sure we've got enough habitat to support all the bees. And honeybees, as I said, are not a native and they're only one species it's our native bees, which are the really diverse ones out there. Native bees are very efficient. Uh, they're often active earlier in the season and in the day than honeybees are. They also collect both pollen and nectar. Unlike honeybees, there's not a lot of work. And if you are renting them, there's no rental fees. And also our native bees, since they tend to work faster, they tend to push honeybees. So they actually keep honeybees moving much more effectively. When we look at bees in general, there are over 20,000 species of bees worldwide. We've got over 4,000 species in North America. Here in Missouri, over 470 species in just the St. Louis area alone. We published a paper a couple of years ago, defining St. Louis as from the river to within the I-270 belt. We have so far identified over 201 species of bees just in that area. There are more types of bees than there are larger taxonomic groups like reptiles, amphibians, birds, or mammals or any of those combined. They vary in size from the smallest bee here in North America, the small orange ones, Perdita minima, only two millimeters long, to the face you may recognize as a large carpenter bee, female if you've got a wooden deck or porch or soffit and fascia. It actually isn't the largest bee we have here in North America, but it's a good representation. And when we look at the bees, there's incredible diversity out there Going clockwise, uh, going top to bottom, we've got masked bee, small carpenter bee, fluorescent green metallic sweat bee, sunflower longhorn bee, spring polyester bee, digger bee, leafcutter bee, small resin bee, and black and yellow bumblebee. And what I want to emphasize with the bees before we get into some of the other beneficials, we really need to understand it's about diversity, not abundance. So I show this study, which really gives a simple example as to what happens. Apples require bees for pollination. 
And this study looked at just using honeybees for pollination and they got good apple production. But when they included native bees, and if you look at this diversity of native bees, they're all a little bit different in size and shape. So they're gonna work the flower a little bit differently. So they're actually gonna increase overall pollination. So you get larger fruit, better seed set, and overall better production. It's really about bee diversity versus bee abundance. And more and more we're finding that that's for whether we're looking at our own crops, but also for ecosystems. It's really about that bee diversity. And that's what we really want to maintain. Now, the next group, when we think about um, insects in the garden, are those beneficial insects, the ones we look at for biocontrol. So biological control is the use of natural enemies to keep unwanted pest populations low. And we can all understand some of the unwanted pest populations that we can think of out there. Um, but we also need to figure out, you know, what are we looking at too? There is an incredible value in biocontrol. The estimated value of pest control by wild beneficial insects is anywhere from four and a half to $12 billion annually for US crops and $100, $100 billion worldwide. So when we think about the use of insecticides and stuff, it's really biological control, which can reduce our overall costs and contamination of the environment for by using insecticides. But when we're thinking about whether insecticides or these beneficials, what are the pests that they're trying to, to deal with? And pests run the gambit from insects, mites, various types of plants, nematodes, vertebrates. But what we really need to understand is when we look at a pest, there's always going to be some herbivory. There's always going to be some little bit of plant damage because that's nature. You know, animals feed. What is it that is acceptable to us? So, so a pest is those that cause unacceptable levels of damage. So there are a number of different types of, for example, unfortunately, the marmorated stink bug, which is an introduced species, produces a lot of cosmetic damage to a lot of fruits. It is becoming more and more of a pest, but those cause, that cosmetic damage isn't necessarily a problem. However, one of our normal squash bugs around here does transmit a virus to squash vines, which causes them to wilt. So where do we need to look at what that level of damage is that we can accept? Now, as I said, oftentimes people think about, well, I've got a pest insecticide. I'll just get something and use it. There are a couple of things we need to consider and hopefully anyone think of using any sorts of insecticides, you really need to understand this. So first off, what is the pest? So you need to really understand the idea of the pest, how much pest pressure there is, is the pest still actually present or you've got the damage and it's, all, and it's gone, so spraying really doesn't do anything, or what you're finding in the garden are older individuals which are just about to end their life, so really it's a, a waste of time to use chemicals. Are there other natural enemies present and are there pollinators present which are going to be necessary for your garden? Will that pesticide reach the target? So there are certain types, the one I like to bring up uh, oftentimes is mosquito spraying. So when you think about those fogging trucks going down the streets, the spray that they use is a contact poison. So if it doesn't hit the mosquitoes directly, it's not gonna be effective. If you have a mosquito on the back of the house and they're spraying the front of the house, it's not gonna hit those at all. So will the pesticide reach the target? What is the vulnerable life stage? You know, is it the egg? Is it the larva? Is it the adult? You know, and also if you are doing crops, when can you spray before you're harvesting so that it also doesn't affect you? And is it actually safe to spray? Some of these chemicals, you know, it is an insecticide. It is, can be very dangerous. So really look at those things. So what I'm really recommending is think about biological control because when we think about insecticides, they're not really selective. It's insecticide means kills insects. So it isn't just saving the ladybird beetles or the butterflies and killing only the ones we don't want, it can kill everything. So encourage those natural predators and natural enemies of those pests. So we can do this in a variety of ways, but first we need to understand what some of those are out there. So when you start going in the garden, you start seeing these, you understand that first off, is this a pest or is this a beneficial? And then what can it actually be helping with in the garden? So they're also going to be assisting with, you know, your pest suppression. 
Uh, they also, many of them are pollinators too. So when we talk about wasps and hoverflies, those are also very beneficial pollinators, particularly the hoverflies. They're probably the, or surfeit flies as I list here, they're probably the second most important group of pollinators next to bees. And then when we look at these, we also need to recognize both the immature and adult stages. So I wanna go quickly through, for those of you may or may not be familiar with metamorphosis. So metamorphosis just means a changing of shape. And when we think about insects in particular, there is a change of shape. So there are two basic kinds. There's incomplete or simple metamorphosis, where when you look at the young or the nymphs, they look more or less like the adults. Uh, for example, here with the pirate bug, or think of cockroaches. Cockroaches are a real good example. Baby cockroaches pretty much look like the adult cockroaches except for the wings. So they just get bigger and bigger. This is a form of incomplete you know, metamorphosis. So bugs in general are examples of that. Praying mantis are example of that. So when we start thinking of those things in the pests, grasshoppers, crickets, aphids, leafhoppers, all of these have incomplete metamorphosis. Complete metamorphosis is where you have those four main life stages. You have egg, you've got the larva stage, you've got a pupa and adult, as in here in Japanese beetles. And with that, you also may have drastically different locations for the different life stages and different resources, whether we're looking at the beneficials or the pests. So how you manage or deal with them, you really need to understand those life stages. Classic example of metamorphosis are butterflies. For many of you who've been dealing with monarchs, you've got the egg, you've got that monarch caterpillar, that beautiful jade green chrysalis, the pupa, and then the adult itself. So some of the pests that do have complete metamorphosis, number of species of moths, beetles, flies, ants, but you also have those same groups which are also beneficials too. So it's also knowing what those species are. So I wanna go into kind of the different groups of those beneficial insects and what their benefits are and what some of the issues to deal with. So there are predators. Predators in general feed on multiple different types of prey. Uh, they're often larger than the prey. And sometimes for some species, the immature forms may be the predators and the adults may not be, or they both might be predators. Lady beetles or ladybird beetles or commonly called ladybugs are probably the classic one for beneficials in the garden. There are a lot of different species, but unfortunately many of them are in decline because of the introduction of the Asian ladybug and also sometimes by uh, misidentification. So the Mexican bean beetle, which is actually a type of ladybird beetle, it is not a beneficial, whereas many of the others are. So really understanding you know, what species you're looking at and there are some conservation programs where you can assist in identifying some of these ladybird beetles which are in decline. But when you look at them, they have, they have complete metamorphosis. So both the adults and the immatures, they're eating usually soft-bodied insects like aphids. The larvae look very different than the adults. Look like, um, if you've ever seen Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, it kind of looks a little bit like what was implanted in the ear of Chekhov. Uh, by Khan himself, but they are really important and very voracious predators. The pupa looks like kind of a mix between the two, but these are often very common. The thing that you have to remember though is for the adults, even though they do feed on the aphids, they do feed on nectar and pollen, so they need to have those resources in the garden too. Ground beetles, particularly the carabids, the one family, they're often called caterpillar hunters. Uh, they are voracious predators, um, but they need some different resources, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Both the adults and the immatures, they eat insects, they eat earthworms. They can overwinter as adults or larva. And there are some species which also consume seeds, so they can actually be very beneficial for getting rid of weed seeds. So it's actually very beneficial to have them in the garden. Lace wings are also voracious predators, particularly of aphids. Actually, the larvae are often called aphid lions. So they're feeding on aphids, mites, thrips, caterpillars, other soft-bodied insects. The adults though, they require pollen and honeydew and a little bit of nectar. Oftentimes you may see them 
or note that they're around. You may not see the adults or the larva, but if you see these eggs on these simple silken stalks, that's an that lets you know that you do have lace wings in your garden. Um, and oftentimes they're laying them on your milkweeds too to deal with those oleander aphids. Praying mantis. We have a couple native species and one introduced, the Chinese mantis. These are very generalist predators. Uh, the adults and the nymphs feed on just about anything. So they're very unselective, uh, particularly as it regards to pests. So they may feed on those bees in your garden. Uh, they may feed on the butterflies. A good, large, giant uh, Chinese mantid could even take a hummingbird too. So they're actually very limited in biocontrol. So oftentimes, you know, you'll see places that sell mantid egg cases, thinking these are gonna be beneficial. If there's no food around, they're just gonna leave. They're really opportunistic feeders. But you may find some of their egg cases in the garden. So the Chinese mantid has a big, uh, very styrofoam looking egg case. The Carolina mantid, much more elongated, looks somewhat similar to an Eastern tent caterpillar egg case, but you can see this nice chevron here. It's called a chevron, which is where the young emerge. Predatory bugs are also very important in the garden. Assassin bugs, ambush bugs, all of these um, are also generalist predators, but because they're really hanging out waiting in your plants, for the most part, they're dealing with caterpillars, aphids, thrips. Uh, they will take bees. I have photographed ambush bugs with small sweat bees, green, or, uh, metallic green sweat bees, bumblebees, depending upon the size of that ambush bug. So they are voracious predators, but they are really handy to have in the garden for dealing with a number of insect pests. A couple bugs that you may not notice um, until you really get down and look at your plants. There's the big eyed bugs and the minute pirate bugs. I tend to see much more in the way of minute pirate bugs in our garden than I do the big eyed bugs. These are very small. Big eyed bugs, less than a quarter inch. The minute pirate bug, less than an eighth of an inch. But these are also voracious predators. So big eyed bugs can eat 80 mites in a day. Minute pirate bugs, you know, more than 50% of the corn earworm eggs and can eat greater than 50% of the mites per day in a garden or in a crop. So these are really important. But again, like the ladybird beetles, they also need pollen as an alternative uh, food resource, but they also need alternative prey too, which I'll talk about in a moment too. Predatory stink bugs. So we've often seen stink bugs in our garden, but they're the quote unquote good and quote unquote bad. So we have those which are predaceous, which will feed on the others. And then we have those which are feeding on our fruits and vegetables. A general rule of thumb is for the predaceous ones, they've got these pointed shoulders and a thicker beak, and I'll show that in a moment, whereas the plant feeders have these more rounded shoulders. If you were to turn them over, you can see the difference. So a plant feeder has this very long, skinny, uh, proboscis for inserting into the plant and being able to suck up the liquids in the phloem and xylem, whereas the predator have these very thick beaks that pierces the exoskeleton of another insect and then liquefies it and sucks out the body parts. Predatory wasps are very important. The adults require pollen and nectar, um, particularly nectar. They are often found in the garden. Some can be very large, like the steel blue cricket hunter and golden digger wasps. Um, oftentimes, they're very specialized on the types of prey that they collect. So steel blue cricket hunters are often collecting uh, grasshoppers, crickets, katydids to raise their young on, similar to the golden digger wasp. Ball faced hornets are a bit more catholic in their taste, will collect a lot of different types of insects to feed. Um, other types specializes on, on spiders, um, so there are a lot of predatory wasps out there. So don't be afraid of them when they're in your garden. Look at them as additional friends. Hoverflies, as I mentioned, are probably the second most important group of pollinators. But for many of them, the maggots are incredibly important, uh, beneficial insects. So in the U North America, we've got over 870 species. 
So the adults are feeding on nectar and pollen, so they're very important pollinators, but the maggots, because the adults will lay their eggs on the plants, those maggots are feeding on aphids and other soft-bodied insects. So really recognizing when you see, you know, like a group of aphids and you see what looks like a little maggot floating around or moving around in there, that is a beneficial, that is helping you in the garden. The next group, so we talked about predators, we talked about pollinators, predators, the next group are the parasitoids. Now there's a difference between generally uh, being parasitic and being a parasitoid. So when we think of a parasite, uh, you can think of athlete's foot. Athlete's foot fungus is a parasite. It is feeding on your feet, but it is not killing you. A parasitoid is one where it develops inside the host and kills it. So parasitoids in general kill, Parasites may kill by weakening, but don't by nature kill outright. So they're usually developing as young inside the host. You've got parasit parasitoid wasps and parasitoid flies. So parasitoid flies, which we have in the garden, tachinids, these are the ones, like this one in the bottom left, uh, they're the ones which look like large house flies or flesh flies, but very hairy. I often see them late in the season after many of the adults have emerged, particularly on goldenrod. Uh, they really seem to like goldenrod, but they're incredibly important in laying their eggs on armyworms, tent caterpillars, et cetera. You also have some more specialized, like this feather-legged fly that specializes on squash uh, bugs. So this fly I actually, I see in our garden, because uh, actually this year we had a big outbreak of squash bugs but they will land on the squash bug, lay their egg right at a joint, and then the maggot or larva actually crawls into the body of the squash bug and eats it from the inside out. Parasitoid wasps, most of these are incredibly small. There are about 65,000 species worldwide. Um, some are very specific on hosts, some are very specific on life stages. So some preying on the eggs, some preying on the young. Many of them are very tiny, uh, but also, even though they're very tiny, they do require pollen and nectar as an additional resource to maintain those individuals. As they are so small, there's absolutely no worries about them, not, no worries about you being stung. Uh, you may not even notice that they're even around at all. And many of them now can actually be purchased through a number of suppliers for their benefits in the garden. This gives an example of the, an aphid parasitoid. So this wasp lays its eggs into the young. The young then develops inside of the aphid. It eventually eats it completely. It emerges and then leaves these mummies of aphids. So if you look around in your garden and see aphid mummies with these nice emergence holes, that's a good sign that you've got some parasitoid wasp dealing with your aphids. Another group I just want to mention are Braconids, another really important group of uh, wasps, parasitoid wasps. There are over 2,000 species. There are some of them which actually have something unique uh, within their life cycle. So they will lay an egg within the body of, say, for example, a caterpillar. And what happens is something called polyembryony, which means that after the egg hatches, you have that larva, that larva then splits and may split again and again and again, creating twins upon twins upon twins. So one egg inserted into the body of a caterpillar may produce dozens of individual offspring. After they finish feeding out the inside of the caterpillar, they emerge, spin their cocoons, and then later fly off to infect another host. Now, when we look at our beneficials, our parasitoids, um, our pollinators, they're all suffering because of a lot of the same things which are affecting wildlife across the world. Loss of habitat and fragmentation, invasive plant species, changes in agricultural practice, misuse of pesticides, disease, parasites, pollution, competition with introduced species. The beneficials actually have a few more issues that we tend to think, don't tend to think about. So that lack of supplemental food, so that's a la loss of habitat. When we think about a beneficial, as I mentioned, they're preying upon other species, 
like ladybird beetles, but they do need those floral resources. Also a lack of hosts or prey. So we often think about, oh, let's have a, a beneficial insect. It'll get rid of all our pests. Well, once those pests are gone, then you don't have that parasitoid or predator anymore. They either die out or leave. So it's actually kind of nice to have that little supplement. Um, I often look at those oleander aphids on milkweed, which usually don't cause severe damage, but that is a good alternate host for a lot of these different types of wasps and ladybird beetles. Some of them can be attacked by their own enemies. Um, depending upon the shape of the habitat and if it's open or not, it may hinder uh, its search for pests. Unfavorable conditions, and unfortunately this is happening all over the place. Lack of suitable overwintering sites. So you can find some companies selling these uh, little beneficial insect boxes, which look like a, a um, a bee hotel, but they have other areas for uh, these insects to uh, hide out in over the winter. But you can very easily do something like this by making sure you have like a little bit of a small wood pile or something where they can, you know, ensconce themselves over the winter and protect themselves. And then, of course, if we don't know what we're dealing with, if we're spraying pesticides, that's going to affect the beneficial insects. If we are tilling the soil, for some of those which are living in the soil um, or nesting in the ground, like a number of our beneficial wasps, like golden digger wasps, which nest in the ground, um, cicada killers, which nest in the ground, you know, doing that is also going to disrupt their life cycles too. So what do we do to help these beneficials? So as I mentioned, having that alternate host and prey, we don't want, nature is not, you know, clean antiseptic. There is diversity out there in the form of various prey, the pollinators, the plants. And if we see a few predator or a few uh, pests, that doesn't mean it's going to be a problem for the garden. If there are a few aphids, as I said, that alternate host actually helps to sustain that population of predators or parasitoids. So look at, you know, what you have in the garden and don't think about, oh, I see it, I have to get rid of it completely because we also need to make sure we've got those additional food resources for those beneficial insects. We need to have some sort of shelters, moderating you know, microclimates, so having a diversity in different structures of the plants, uh, different seasonal refuges, and overwintering sites. This is what actually becomes a problem for some, like the Asian ladybugs, which like to come into our houses. Um, also, the marmorated sink bug likes to come into our houses too, the, the pest species. But if we can find another resource for them to hibernate, that'd be great. And then, of course, as well, food and nectar, uh, food in the form of nectar and pollen. So I want to touch upon that. So when we're looking at either the uh, pollinators or these beneficials, think about how you're planting. So clumps of single species are really good because remember those flowers are the billboards, the signposts to attract those insects to your garden. If you cannot necessarily plant like a clump, sometimes what's actually really much better in some respects is repeating that planting throughout the landscape. So you're actually increasing that natural foraging behavior of those uh, insects. And additionally, if you say, for example, have a pollen and nectar source for a beneficial insect just in one location, but you may have you know, potential pest problems in a variety of areas, by dispersing those and repeating those plantings, it actually causes them to look more and wider into your garden and actually potentially create a better control of pest populations in your garden. Of course, you want to plant diversity, maximizing that floral diversity. You also want to Make sure you've got things blooming spring, summer, and fall because those three seasons are when all of these are going to be active. And think about the structure too. Diversify that structure and shape, color, size, and also the plantings too. So making sure you have grasses as well as the forbs and flowers because that can also be a refuge. And I'll give you a, an example in a moment of one group of animals which really likes those clumping grasses. The one thing you have to recognize, particularly with the beneficial uh, insects in the form of those predators, whether they be wasps or ladybird beetles, 
unlike the bee or a butterfly, they do not have a long proboscis. So they actually need really simple flowers and usually small flowers, something with a platform that they can actually get into. So when we think of the, you know, things like wild carrots, um, golden rods, those things with short flowers are really, and asters, those are really beneficial for these types of beneficial insects because they can't use those deep corollas, whether it be something like a, a foxglove beard tongue um, or obedient plant or any species like that. They really need those open kind of plants to support those insects. And think about diversifying. So we often tend to think about the floral resources in the way of flowers, but think about shrubs, think about hedgerows. And these can be in the form of a variety of different types of low growing shrubs. These are also, many of them can be good pollinator sources. They can also be good food resources for uh, fruits, for the birds in your neighborhood. But think creatively as to different types of habitat. You know, hedgerows, we often tend to think about them as a, you know, something in the farm landscape or a larger landscape issue. But even on a smaller scale, here in our backyard, we have different types of hollies, uh, willows, uh, American plum, all of these, and um, aronia, uh, chokeberry, all of these things which produce a good pollen and nectar sources, but then also have other benefits too to wildlife. And also experiment. Um, as I say, for some of these species, you know, it's the floral resources or shelters, but also the nesting sites. So this is an experiment I did this year, creating a bee and beneficial wasp bed. I dug out a square meter of our soil by our house. And there are very few instructions on this. I found one research group that did a 20 inch uh, deep hole. If you've ever tried to dig 20 inches deep into St. Louis clay soil, uh, and a meter square. After 10 inches, I was pretty darn tired. So I left it at 10. I incorporated some sand into the mix. And actually in this first year, I had some uh, mining bees, some adrenids, and some small sweat bees. But if you'll notice the series of sticks at the top of this bed, I stuck in a series of stems from blackberry canes and also hydrangea, which have a very pithy stem. And there are a few types of bees and particularly beneficial wasps, which will utilize these. One of the bees very commonly will use these vertical nests and also those vertical stems in your garden. If you're cleaning up your garden, make sure you leave about 18 to 24 inches tall, give them some nesting sites. This is a small carpenter bee. This is one of our smaller bees, uh, to give you an idea of size. This is on a Ridgeron or Daisy Fleabane, which is about the size of a dime. So this is a very small bee. But here you can see a female. She has created a nest in this pithy stem of blackberry. She dug it out herself. It is a small carpenter bee. And all of those stems that you saw in that previous picture had either a small carpenter bee or a beneficial wasp nesting in it this very first year. Uh, they use them much more quickly than the bed itself. But those bed that open habitat for things like, as I said, golden digger wasps and um, cicada killers, they need that sort of open um, bear habitat in order to create their nests, in order to raise their young. If you have been just trimming around the garden, you may notice that you already have some of these taking residence. So this is hydrangea. If you ever cut through hydrangea, you've got that nice white pithy stem. But if you notice that there's either a hole or it looks like a little bit of compost, something is nesting in it, in this particular case, I opened up the stem and I found three cocoons. In this particular case, it was not bees that were utilizing it. It was actually cribronid wasps. This is a very small wasp which specializes on flies. So they were nesting in there, collecting flies you know, in the garden and raising their young on those flies. And as well, bees will also utilize this. This is a leafcutter bee. I watched this bee for two days nesting in this elderberry. Uh, stem. And she filled it up repeatedly with leaf material, creating the individual cocoons where she was going to raise her young. And as I mentioned, talking about that structure, when we think about grasses, a common place where a lot of these carabids, these um, 
uh, fire researchers, which is a green beetle, the caterpillar hunters will tend to hang out are in areas that you can create called beetle banks or bumps. So like in a larger field, like in agriculture, you can create these banks that you then plant grasses like, you know, big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, drop seed, nice clump forming grasses where those beetles can reside from inclement weather, but then also protect themselves. And then they'll go out and forage within your crop. But you can do this in your garden just by creating clumps or bumps with these grasses too, to support these types of beetles. So to finish up, I want to reiterate a couple of the points here. So for all, for all of these, for these predators, for these pollinators, for these parasitoids, you first off, you want to create these diverse, dense wildflower plantings and also include other structures too. Plant some grasses, shrubs, et cetera, creating these diverse habitats for these species, creating nesting sites and shelters for them for either the winter or during the season. Really look at reducing your use of insecticides and herbicides because those are going to be ones which are going to affect those pollinators and beneficials. And most importantly, learn and understand the needs of your friends with benefits in the garden. So when you're looking in the garden, you can kind of see what you have and start identifying them. And so a few resources to kind of help you in the garden, the Xerxes Society, um, if you go to their publications section, you can find their uh, pollinator resources, but then there are also farming resources, mosquito resources, a number of downloadable uh, guides that can help you on everything from um, identifying some of the bees in your garden to large organic farming practices, etc. If you go to the Zoo Center for Native Pollinator Conservation website, we have a downloadable two-page Missouri bee guide to give you an idea of some of the basic bees and also a bumblebee guide that you can download for the bumblebees found here in Illinois and Missouri. And also learn a bit more about the work that we're doing at the St. Louis Zoo here in Missouri and across the country and in other countries too. Pollinator Partnership, you go to their website, they have a number of resources and brochures on everything from pesticides, don't worry about stings, but you can also put in your zip code into the, the one resource and it will, you can then download a, an individualized guide for that particular eco region of what plants are going to be beneficial for a variety of different types of pollinators, whether it be flies, wasps, bees, or birds. And there are a number of books out there which I, I find which are easy to use and understand and give a good info, a lot of information. Attracting Native Pollinators, that was put up by the Xerxes Society a number of years ago now, is really a good one. It's one of the, it's really probably the first book that went into the various genera of bees, it also talks about butterflies, and everything from small to larger practices. One of the best books I've found on beneficial insects is Farming with Native benefic, Beneficial Insects. So it talks about pest control, improving it, identifies those beneficials in your garden. Um, it also presents the research which supports the work of those different things, whether it be beetle banks or hedgerows or whatever, those benefits that are going to support those beneficials. This book is often sometimes hard to find. I actually just looked on Amazon today, there are a few copies left, but you can download a Kindle version too. So even if you cannot get a soft cover, the, the Kindle edition should be readily available if you've got a device to use that. If you wanna learn more about the bees, there's the bumblebees of New York, New York, sorry, North America, the bees in your backyard. Um, and then also two of Heather Holmes books, which really focus a lot on the plants. So it gives you an idea of what kind of plantings that are going to support the bees. But remember too, that as you're supporting the bees, you're also gonna support a lot of these other beneficials. Just remember for those things like ladybird beetles, wasps, making sure you have those shallower corollas, uh, those landing platforms, those shallower flowers, more simple flowers to support them. And then almost all the time people ask me, well, what's a good guide to insects? And there are a lot of guides to insects out there. This is actually my favorite the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects in North America. It covers everything, uh, but what I like about it, it probably shows more illustrations than any other compared to Audubon, Peterson's, et cetera. 
So it gives you an idea of both the size and diversity. This is just a couple pages of the robber flies, which are beneficial predators in your garden, feeling on, feeding on other species. But this kind of gives you an idea of how the book is laid out. It doesn't give necessarily a lot of information, but it gives you a good start to find out more information. But if you're trying to identify a number of things, this is a good start. It covers a lot of bees, a lot of wasps, a lot of butterflies, a lot of moths, a lot of flies. So it really gives an idea of what's in your garden. And if you do have any additional questions, uh, we're going to have a little Q&A right now. But later on, if you've got any questions, feel free to contact me at the zoo at spivac at stlzoo.org. And I'm happy to answer your questions um, about bees, butterflies, beneficial insects, um, yeah, life in general. Whatever you're thinking about asking me about, I'm happy to talk to you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Brooke and to Carol for some Q&A. And thank you so much. That was wonderful. This is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and our Grow Native program. And we do have uh, quite a few questions that have come in. And uh, I will do my best to get to all of your questions. Um, wanted to note too that uh, in addition to the wonderful uh, resources and references that Ed provided, if you go to our grownative.org website, you'll find a wealth of, of materials, um, including several things that Ed has written. Um, and we'll share those in an email that uh, Brooke will send out tomorrow. So we're trying to get to all your questions. If we can't though, do check out the references that Ed provided. Um, hopefully you noted his email address and uh, you can also look at the Grow Native site. So uh, I'll just jump into the questions. Kathy asks, can you hear me okay, Ed? Yep, I can. Kathy says, there have been several articles written about the negative impact that the non-native honeybees have had, that is competition for food and spreading uh, diseases from honeybees on both our native bumblebees and other native bees. As someone who has a passion for restoring local prairies for native pollinators, and also keeps honeybees, can Dr. Spivak please address these concerns? Should we not keep honeybees if they're creating a problem for the bumblebees? So as I'd mentioned before, oftentimes when people come to me about honeybees, it's their concern that bees are endangered and they want to help them. And that is not the case with honeybees. So as I said, if you're really into honeybees, into honey, um, then, it's, then I feel free to do that. The biggest issue is numbers. So where we have, you know, placed a lot of honeybees, you know, whether it be cities or um, in open habitats, wherever there might be uh, native bees, there are a couple things to consider. First off, are the flowers kind of rather ephemeral? So as I mentioned, like in the Southwest, where you may have only a bloom in flowers when you have a good ample rain, well, the honeybees might get there in force and actually outcompete some of those natives. Where we have a lot of good floral resources, that should not be a problem. When you look at the research, the issues on competition with honeybees are negative, no issue, uh, maybe a slight benefit. So it's really kind of a site location and what's happening. The biggest issue is really where there are too many honeybees and this is a concern, particularly in cities where people have gotten this idea that, oh, I want to help the bees, I want to get involved. And several years ago in London, they uh, started telling people quit actually beekeeping as hobbyists because there weren't enough floral resources in the city of London to support all those honeybees. A recent paper has just come out talking about how they're actually potentially outcompeting and uh, harming other types of wildlife too. So whether it be if you've got too many honeybees and you have some of them swarming or absconding from those hives, they may be taking up residence in nest hollows, which our native birds might be utilizing or native bats. So that could be an issue. Um, so it really is, look at the area around where you're placing your bees. Do you have a lot of bees, a lot of honeybees? Um, do you have enough floral resources? And that's the biggest one. Do you have enough floral resources that are going to support a lot of these? And there are some flowers which are only gonna support some of our native bees, um, whether it be crops such as tomatoes and squash, which honeybees 
Um, can't do tomatoes and they are lousy at squash. But other things like Pensamen digitalis, the Fox Club beer tongue in the spring, it's a really good native bee plant. And I rarely see uh, honeybees on it. So you can look at what you're planting too, which actually can support some of our native bees as well as honeybees. But it's, it's really what I always try to emphasize. It's about habitat. Is there enough habitat to support what we're trying to put? So whether it be humans, whether it be cattle, whether it be cats and dogs, whatever it might be, is there enough habitat to support? And then for pollinators, it's really plant more native plants is gonna be one of the most beneficial things that's gonna support native bees and then those, whether uh, managed honeybees or feral honeybee populations. Thank you, Ed. Some more questions about bees. Um, one is about the elderberry and blackberry stems. Do you need to cut the stems or does the insect drill into them? And, and, and then a related question um, from, I've been told that bee houses are bad for bees after the first year. My yard is organic and I make sure my soil is healthy. Is it bad to keep a bee house for more than one season? And by bee house, I'm assuming she means sort of a structure with several right. cut stems. So. Yeah, can you talk about, do you need to cut the stems or the insects drill into them? And then what about the bee houses? Yeah, so for things like, as I said, the hydrangeas, the blackberries, it is really those cut stems. So when you cut them, you actually open up that center pith to the bees. They, they're not chewing through the outside of the, the nest, uh, outside of the stem itself. They're looking for that opening. Now you could make a small drilling, but just that simple act of trimming. And as I said, if you are trimming, save those cut stems. So as I said, you know, I saved, you know, those about 18 inch long blackberry canes and hydrangea and then use those as nesting sites. I could either bundle them or stick them vertically in the ground. And vertically, it's interesting. The small carpenter bees are one of the few bees which really like using that vertical stem, but also a number of our beneficial wasps use them too. But it's really that cut stem. And, and usually over time, whether it's a natural break or a cut, that's going to do it. Now, regarding the bee hotels, um, usually after two to three years, uh, they can be problematic because there may be a buildup in pests. There can be a buildup in uh, different types of fungus. There are some ways to deal with that. Um, one, if you're using like a solid block of wood and just it's so you think it's so contaminated, the only thing you can do is to get rid of it. But you can even with those take um, paper, roll it up and insert it so that it's an easy way for you to clean it out each year. If you're using stems um, or things like uh, reeds or bamboo, those can be replaced you know, every couple of years. So you're creating a new nesting site for them um, or also things like um, cardboard tubes. Those are beneficial too. Don't use plastic straws. Um, Bees really don't like those, but there are ways you can do that. You can also try, um, if you do have a solid structure um, and the bees have left, you can use about like a 10% bleach solution, soak that. Um, you have to make sure it's really rinsed and cleaned out very well, but you can reuse them. Uh, the bees themselves are actually cleaning them out, but you can potentially have uh, an additional buildup. So what I would recommend if you're looking at you may be getting too much buildup, put up another bee hotel so that you do have a resource for them. So you're not just removing the one which is contaminated, give us some more nesting sites, and then you can take down the other one. Once the bees have left, you can then clean it out or dispose of it. Thanks, Ed. Um, moving on to mosquitoes. Betty has a question. Are there any homemade mosquito sprays that are considered natural and safe to use? Um, what I recommend is actually um, the sprays, and, and this is the issue with uh, mosquito control. Mosquito control in general, at least what people see, are the sprays, but those sprays are usually contact. Uh, they, the mosquito has to come in, you know, be sprayed directly by it. What's far more effective is actually dealing with the young, dealing with the larva. And there are some very simple ways of dealing with those. First off, make sure you've got no bodies of water, you know, resting anywhere. So make sure your gutters are clean. Uh, if you've got anything as small as a, even a bottle cap that's holding water, empty those out. 
if you do not have or you do, aren't able to get rid of that standing water, uh, BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, you can get in dunks or in granules from places like Home Depot. This is a very selective insecticide, it's actually a bacteria that the filter feeding young take in and then uh, it actually perforates the gut, they eventually die. But it's very selective on mosquito larvae. But a very simple non-chemical way of dealing with particularly things like the house mosquito, genus Culex, is making a trap for them. And the trap is very simple. Get a bucket, put some water in it, and then put some vegetation like grass clippings, a few leaves, whatever. And what happens is that sort of steeps um, and starts producing bacteria and fungus um, and algae. And that's what the larvae feed on. So that's what the females are attracted to. They're attracted to the smell of that trap. So the Culex, they lay their eggs in what are called rafts. So you'll see what look like very small sesame seeds floating at the top. And what you're doing is just using up that, all their reproductive effort. They lay their eggs on there. And then once you see them, just dump out that water and put it on your lawn or your flowers or whatever else, set it back up again. And there you have it, this continually renewable uh, mosquito trap that deals with the house mosquitoes. There are some other traps. So BioQuip is a company which sells what they call the GAT trap, which is the Gravid 80s trap. It is specifically for uh, the Asian tiger mosquito. It's very similar in structure, but it has a, a cone at the top. It doesn't use chemicals, but the 80s mosquitoes actually are cavity nesters. So they fly in and the way it's designed, they can't fly out. So eventually they just use up their resources too and then the females also get trapped. So that's also a very uh, simple non-chemical way of doing it. It's interesting, the first one that we bought, you know, we got one of them and we're looking in, it's like, well, there should be all of these, you know, dead female mosquitoes in there. We couldn't find any, but there were all these wings. So what had happened is the ants, some ants in our garden had found their way in and actually went in, grabbed all the dead mosquitoes, just left all the wings. So they had a little pile of wings, but all the bodies of the mosquitoes were gone. So you, by first glance, you didn't think it was working, but on closer inspection, oh, it's working, and the ants were just cleaning up the debris. Um, some more questions about, uh, about bees. Um, back to the, well, one question when you were talking about, you know, there are these limiting factors of, you know, honeybees and, and native bees, but you need a lot of floral resources. Right. Question, how do you know if you've got enough floral? <laughs> what would you consider enough? And and then another question about, you know, do you change out the stems, the stem, the, the cut stems? So, um, yeah, if you have enough, I think the easiest way, you can actually kind of do this anecdotally because uh, it takes a lot more research. And there's actually a large project going on by USDA, NRCS, Natural Resource uh, Conservation Service out in Utah, doing a longer term study on honeybee, native bee competition and seeing where it's actually affecting it. But one simple way is actually, once you start planting, start looking at your garden, you know, what are you seeing more of? Are you seeing more honeybees? Are you seeing more you know, native bees or just a, a nice balance? You're not seeing one bullying the other. Oftentimes, you may have a native bee and a honeybee shows up and the others will fly off. Even though honeybees don't tend to be that aggressive, some of our native bees are not very aggressive at all. So just kind of watch your, your garden and see what's actually going on. And, and people, you should be doing that anyway, because this is a way to actually see what's, uh, what is in your garden. And you start identifying the diversity of bees too. I mean, for our house here, uh, we live in Lindenwood Park in St. Louis. And we have, ooh, how many genera have I found? Uh, I think 24 genera of bees so far using our garden on our, just our corner lot because we make sure we have a lot of floral diversity that is going to support a diversity of bees. And that's really the most important thing. If you have just one type or mostly one type, you're going to not support as many types of bees. So it's really that floral diversity and that spring, summer, and fall, which is going to be beneficial. Regarding those stems, probably the easiest thing to think about. So often people wonder, well, how do I, when do I clean up my garden? We've got this pension for cleaning up gardens, which is a bit much. I have a little kitten who's just complaining at me. Hold on. Uh, so 
what you want to do, so for example, if you've got, say, like goldenrod, and you cut them at, say, about uh, 18 to 24 inches, and just leave those stems. So the upper portions you can you know, remove, but just leave those stems. So those stems are going to act as nesting sites for wasps and bees. And then eventually they're just going to break down themselves. The next year's growth is just going to come up you know, within them. So just leaving that is just a simple way if you need some sort of clean garden area or your homeowners association needs you to clean something up or whatever. Uh, here you're still creating a habitat uh, that eventually is going to be re-nourishing back into the soil. Thanks, Ed. And we have a, a nice illustration that Heather Holm and her colleagues did yeah. that show cutting the stems. And then, yeah, you can leave them. They'll eventually just fall over and then the new, the new growth will kind of hide it. We do have a request to see the kitten. Uh, let's see if she'll grab. Come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> and of then, course, of, of course, not. she'll come here. Oh. Also, she's running away. Oh, we'll see if she shows up. Also, wanted to let people know we have a grow needed leave the leaves sign, yard sign, and it and it illustrates the importance of leaving stems standing and and, and fallen leaves. And uh, you can find that on our grow native site, and that kind of helps your neighbors uh, understand why you're doing what you're doing. And I really like what you said about, you know, this is about a. Well, I just want to, just Carol, I just want to mention just to follow up what you just said. Yeah. We have our leave the leaves sign. We also have um, the native uh, pollinator habitat sign. We also have a Xerxes sign in our garden. And just the other day, I actually, uh, a neighbor was walking around taking photographs of those signs. And because she said, I want to redo, you know, our garden, I needed some resources. Said, well, this is a good one, but make sure you take the Missouri Prayer Foundation Grow Native sign because that website will get you to the Grow Native resources to find those nurseries, seed suppliers, installers. So having those signs up both educates uh, your neighbors but then also allows them to find those resources to do what you're doing also. Right, and I like what you said about observing. I mean, when we garden for beneficial insects, this is also about just fun and entertainment is going out and seeing what's going on in your garden. And like you say, just frequently being out there and seeing what's happening, you'll, you'll learn so much. Um, let's see, some more questions here. Um, are the wasps we refer to as as mud daubers or dirt daubers, are they beneficial to gardens? Yeah, so um, they're beneficial in two ways. So the mud daubers, actually many of them are actually specialists on spiders, but they also do caterpillars too. But the one thing we don't tend to think about, so if you've got mud daubers nesting around your house, leave the nests up. So they will only use them for that first year, but there are a number of leaf cutter bees which will actually use them. So that next year, so people have a tendency to clean up everything, remove those mud dauber nests, leave them up, and you're actually creating additional nesting resources for leafcutter bees. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, oh, the question, can you breed lady beetles? Uh, people have tried, and we've actually tried the insectarium too. There are some artificial diets. Uh, it isn't easy. Uh, the artificial dyes are kind of iffy. They really need, um, you know, the aphids for food. So if, if you can raise aphids, then, then you could probably raise some lady bird beetles. Um, I usually don't recommend it uh, because it can be a lot of work. The biggest concern is if you think about purchasing ladybird uh, beetles, See if you can find out what kind they're doing. Oftentimes it is the Asian ladybird beetle and they are actually becoming a problem because they're out competing our native species. But I think the most important thing is uh, really having, again, those floral resources, uh, creating habitats for them to nest in. And particularly having those, making sure you have at least a few aphids around for them to feed on. Uh, if you have no aphids, you're not gonna collect it, have any ladybird beetles. As an example, when I used to work at the Bronx Zoo, we had the created this butterfly habitat called the Butterfly Zone, and I had a outbreak of uh, aphids in there, and I released a few ladybird beetles. They, of course, cleaned everything up. Eventually, they you know, moved on. But what I didn't find, didn't realize was that our reptile department at the Bronx Zoo is actually sneaking in there, collecting those aphids to feed to some of their reptiles, yeah, and amphibians. So. 
the ladybirds just cleaned up everything because it was nice confined space, but we need to make sure that we have that resource to maintain them long-term. So make sure you have a few innocuous pests around in the garden. Thanks. Well, we have a few more questions if you're game to keep oh, answering. Game. Okay, very good. Um, Donna asks, an earlier speaker said that there was relatively little diversity among native pollinators in the middle of the city, but it sounds like you have a fair amount in, in where you live. Does it matter if you are a quote oasis among lawnophiles or will the critters still find you? Uh, for some of them, I'm amazed how they find you. So first off, of all the cities which have been surveyed for bee diversity, St. Louis is number one. So that can be kind of cool. So we don't have to be number one for chlamydia or anything else. We're actually number one for bee diversity with over 200 species, more than Chicago or Detroit or even Singapore where there's been some survey work. So we have an incredible diversity here within the city. Also, if, if you plant it, it's amazing for certain species, they just show up. Uh, the best example are squash bees. So I plant squashes. I have no idea where the nearest squash patch is. And this is a bee which specializes on squashes. So I plant them and they show up. I have no idea how. When I first did them in Dogtown where we used to live, I had both genera of squash bees show up here in Lindenwood Park. Uh, so far I've only had Pepinapus, not Xenoglossa, but they show up. I have no idea how they find it. So no matter where you are, you're going to support those bees. Now there are gonna be certain species which are very specialized for certain types of plants. Uh, for example, like hibiscus bees, if there are no hibiscus in the area, you're not going to get those species. Uh, but you know, if you've got that diversity, it's amazing how they will eventually find you. Uh, and sometimes they'll be a little more diverse than you think. So this year in our garden, I had um, Andrina rudbeckii, uh, which was a first in our garden for this year, which is a specialist on uh, Rudbeckia um, and uh, Coreopsis, but actually, you know, or actually uh, uh, Rutibita, but we actually had it on Coreopsis. So they will occasionally use something fairly similar, uh, but if you plant it, it's amazing how some of these species, even if you feel that you're an island in the middle of nowhere, really start doing that. But by doing that and then having things like those signs, getting people to start creating stepping stone uh, corridors. You have more and more people creating these habitats and you're actually creating this corridor for the bees, for the butterflies, for all species. Think of monarchs. Monarchs is, is the largest corridor anywhere from Canada down to Mexico and they're going stepping stone from all these milkweed patches. So making sure you have milkweed all the way down between those you know, areas and then those fall blooming things like asters and goldenrods and blazing star for the fall migration, as well as the other summer and spring blooming floral resources. That is creating a corridor. That's an example of what people can do. But if you're planting for monarchs, you're also helping bees and other beneficials. Right, thanks. I think there were a few questions when you were talking about the predatory versus the plant suck, juice sucking uh, mm -hmm. stink bugs. And uh, I think what you meant the, by you know, the predatory, they're quote, good for your garden because they might be eating pests that might otherwise be harming your vegetables. But could you maybe just elaborate? And also uh, there was a question of uh, were, the, was, were the predatory ones, the ones with the pointed shoulders? And I right. said, yes, I think that was correct. Yeah, so the, the predatory stink bugs, so they're all quote, unquote, stink bugs. Um, but the predatory are those which feed on other insects. So they're the ones with a, a very stout proboscis, which is used to pierce the outside, the exoskeleton of the other insect and then suck out its, its body. They're the ones with the more pronounced spikes on their shoulders, kind of think of them as little warriors. Uh, the other ones that uh, we often see, which are the problem, whether it be the marmorated stink bug, the introduced, or um, as I said, I had these, you know, I guess lovely, brown and gray squash bugs, uh, very common uh, type in our garden this year. We had a lot of them. Uh, and those, they did not have the, the pointed shoulders. If you turn them over, you can have a very slender proboscis. And that's for going into the cell walls of the plant. So they need to do that without necessarily damaging it because they're going to be sucking up the, the liquids. But many of those can transmit diseases. So this particular species 
does transmit uh, squash vine wilt. So I did have a couple of vines which died out. I did have some beneficial insects, but not enough. I actually took out a little dust busters, I actually started vacuuming them all up. And then I froze, the, froze them and then later put them out for the birds to eat. So there's a way that you can deal with them. But yeah, so the kind of the quote unquote good ones are those which are gonna feed on the other types of squash bugs, caterpillars and other things. And then the quote unquote bad ones are those which are going to cause some damage. Now, even bad is kind of a relative term. So as I mentioned, the marmorated stink bug, which is becoming a major problem, it has a tendency, at least right now, it's not transmitting much in the way of diseases, but it causes a lot of blemishes, discoloration, and when we think about, about our food, we often want something perfect. Well, nature isn't perfect. So if you have a blemish on something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's you know, inedible. Uh, there is a type of uh, fly that um, burrows into the rinds of some squashes, but it only causes very minute damage right at that location. The rest of the squash is fine. So we need to think about what is acceptable to us, you know, what we're eating, you know, what parts of the plant we're eating, and is this really a problem? As I said, with the squash bugs I had this year, they were causing some vine wilt. Um, but there are also ways of planting as well as beneficial insects to try and draw them away. I had squash vine borers on our milkweed. And if you're unfamiliar with squash vine borer, it's actually rather pretty moth. A, dark emerald to forest green with orange patches, but they lay their eggs on the vine of the squashes and the young, the larvae actually burrow in and, and hollow out the inside of the, the squash vine. It eventually just collapses, it dies. Um, interestingly, I didn't have, seem to have an issue with the caterpillars, even though I did see the adults on our milkweed pollinating the milkweed, but it wasn't an issue with the, the vine. So look at what those pests are and actually if they are a problem too. Thanks, Ed. And just, uh, I know you covered this, but just want to make sure that I've given the right information. In terms of cutting the uh, elderberry and the blackberry stems, mm -hmm. um, the question about when to do that. I mean, you could still do it now, couldn't you? But oh, yeah. Yeah, but could do yeah, it you cut them now and then um, you can use them later on. If you, if you have something that's already cut, um, Look at the end of it too to see if anybody's actually using it already so you don't cut off their home. So as I said, look at the end of it. If it's, um, you can see like a little bit of plug either with plant material or what looks like a, like a regular sawdust from like the small carpenter bees or that as I showed with the cabronid wasp, looks like a little compost, leave those because there's something already nesting in them. But those new areas, if you're gonna be pruning, so I need to, do some pruning this uh, winter for our particular like American plum, et cetera. Um, not necessarily the best, but we do have some elderberries, which will be uh, trimming up a little bit. So turn them up now, which is good for the plant, but then it's also leaving those openings for next year for beneficial you know, pollinators or insects to use. Thank you. Um, uh, there were a couple of very interesting questions um, about what happens if a bird takes the caterpillar, which has parasitoids inside it. Will that hurt the bird? No, it just gets more protein. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, yeah, that parasitoid is a specialist on the caterpillar, so all it's getting is additional food resources. Yeah, that's what I, I wondered. But And then another question, can, can a wasp parasitoid lay eggs on a, on a human? Uh, I don't know of any wasps. There are some flies. Uh, we don't tend to have them actually, though there, is, there are some native bot flies. Um, but really we don't have those. The, the wasps know because it's, they're very specialized oftentimes on their host. They're finding them by chemical cues. Humans don't produce the same chemical cue as particular species of caterpillar or like with that one fly that specializes on the squash uh, bugs it is homing in on both the physical appearance and the chemical cues. So there are no wasps which do this. Now, as I said, there are some flies which parasitize humans, bot flies in particular, but in the tropics, you'll find some weird tropical rainforest ecologists who really love to you know, keep their first bot fly. 
because they have this unique life cycle where the fly actually grabs a mosquito, lays its egg on the mosquito. The mosquito then bites a human. That egg then hatches. That maggot climbs off the mosquito and into the hole that the mosquito made to drink your blood and then lives in that site. But it's this interesting relationship, but it's really, it really evolved for other types of mammals. Um, but with humans, not so much. Screw worms, which are also a type of fly, they're also laying their eggs on the umbilicus and any open wounds in livestock. But these are really specialists on those sorts of animals. But there are no wasps which do this to humans. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Brooke just texted me that she's obsessed with bot flies and she would be honored to be a host just to have a front row seat and study. That's just weird. <laughs> no. Because you can see it you know, in your arm or where, body part, you can see it's proboscis, kind of, or it's, actually it's not as proboscis, it's air tube coming out and breathing. It's like, ugh, that's just... <laughs> Oh, Brooke is just very hardcore uh, interested okay. in science. Okay, there it you go. Um, and we love her for it. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Um, a question Does the increase in insects and other or insects also increase the snake frequency in our gardens? The snake frequency? Um, no, not really, because the, the snakes that we have around here, probably the most common are the garter snakes. They're going to be feeding on uh, earthworms and slugs. So it's not really having an effect on those. I do want to mention, though, something interesting about slugs. And this is where we get into this curious relationship with insecticides. So many of you have heard a, there's this whole class of insecticides called neonicotinoids. They're basically artificial nicotine substitutes. They are systemic pesticides where they're applied to be soaked up into the body of the plant, creating basically the entire plant becomes toxic, even up to the pollen and nectar. But what's interesting is it can have secondary effects. And this was a beautiful study that was done out of uh, Penn State looking at soybeans and there was use for uh, seed coats, which included a neonicotinoid, to incorporate into soybeans into the crops in Pennsylvania. Well, in Pennsylvania, and, and that's to affect actually the soybean aphid. Soybean aphids were not the major problem in that area where the neonics would actually could have a, a, an impact on. It was actually slugs. Now, think of this, neonicotinoids is an insecticide, a slug is not an insect. So the slugs were feeding on the soybeans. They were not being affected, but by taking in that plant, they became toxic. And those ground beetles that I talked about were feeding on the slugs and dying. So the predator that controlled the slugs was being killed because the neonic was being used basically inappropriately. So they then had a massive outbreak of slugs in some of these crops. I mean, some of the pictures you'd see, like you know, whole fronts of combines basically covered like you just painted it with slugs because the predators had been controlled. So you have to think about how some of these pesticides can have a secondary effect that you didn't actually think about. So in this particular case, not using an insecticide is actually more beneficial for a farmer than actually using an insecticide. So we need to think about what we're trying to use and how we use them too. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll just do a couple more questions. Um, we do still have 165 people tuned in, oh, cool. but we'll just do a couple more here. Uh, and again, we'll have a wealth of resources for everybody um, in the e news or in the email tomorrow. Um, Brad asked, you mentioned 15 to 25 species of native plants. What happens beyond 25 species? Are more harmful or just not as beneficial? In other words, are there diminishing returns? Um, it, it's actually sort of a diminishing returns, but actually increases. So when you look at, it's always interesting seeing my own image and how this works. So when you look at a graph of diversity, bee diversity and plant diversity, it goes up as sort of a rising asymptote. It goes up arcing and then it slowly starts leveling off. It will uh, be a little higher, but you get this uh, in that first group of that 15 to 20 plants, you get a lot of different species. And then after that, then you start getting additional species, but not as many because you, you really filled up a lot. But it's those additional species which can be incredibly unique. And that's what's actually really interesting too. When you start finding those resources, 
So for example, this year, I always set up B hotels um, and this year, and, and I always see Carter Bees, which are, a, you know, we have at least one non-native, the wool Carter Bee, black and yellow, they're flying around uh, the lamb's ear. But I've never had Carter Bees, particularly native ones nesting in my plant, in my uh, bee hotels until this year. And the re way I found it out was I planted white sage, Artemisia ludovisiana, and I looked at the white sage and there were all these, it was looking odd, it was kind of, if you know white sage, it has this actually a white hairy covering to the leaves, but it was also looking green. So it was like, it was just this weird mold. And I kept thinking, well, maybe it needs more water or what, until I actually saw the bee land and it actually was scraping those hairs. And that's what was causing those bare green patches. So scraping all the white. And then I looked at my one bee hotel in the, the backyard and it looked like it was just shoved with cotton. So the white sage, it just collected all of it. So by having that white sage, it actually created a, uh, a nesting resource for the bees, which I may see every once in a while, but this now allows them to sustain that population. So by just by adding that one species to the garden, I added another species of bee for specialist bees where they may need something particular like hibiscus. Having hibiscus, so we have uh, planted hibiscus for the first time this year, we now have hibiscus bees. So you may not see that big jump, but you start adding these really cool, unique species and sometimes specialist species. So you get that burst of generalists, but then you start adding more and more. And that's what the, the cool part. Thanks, Ed. So, I mean, if you don't have much space, strive for 15 to 25, but if you've got the space and the energy, go for it. I mean, we have more than 2,000 native plants in, in Missouri and, and more than that in the lower Midwest and, and so many insects have sp special relationships with specific plants. So uh, I think it's wonderful and that's a great example of what you got to observe by adding that extra plant. Um, just uh, end with one more question. Um, Kathy says, would you prescribe burns on our prairie? It sounds like the burn will kill some nesting insects, but does the benefit outweigh the impact of the burn? So that's where it gets into, you don't burn everything. Uh, burning is a natural part of prairie, and Carol can go into this probably far more than I can, but a general rule of thumb, you don't really want to burn or cut down more than a third to a quarter at a time, because that allows for part of that habitat to be maintained. So for those stem and uh, twig nesting bees, yeah, you burn it, it's gonna kill them. But you have some set aside, you're going to maintain a source population. If the burn isn't too hot, um, it is not going to affect those ground nesting bees. So that's not gonna be an issue. But burning is a major uh, part of prairie ecosystems and actually a lot of ecosystems. We just happen, we just had to suppress everything and get out of that cycle. Now there's some places where you can't necessarily burn. So by doing a short mow can start having some semblance of it. But even, you know, <laughs> whether you should do it or not, actually one year we had this little prairie patch on our uh, house in Dogtown and yeah, we, we burned the, the drop seed. Uh, it came up nicely later on. Uh, but burning is the natural part of maintaining an ecosystem, particularly for a prairie ecosystem. So you just don't want to do it all at once. You just want to maintain this patchwork or mosaic. So you're always keeping some habitat as a source for those bees and other animals. Thanks, Ed. And with the Missouri Prairie Foundation, you know, we, we burn just a third to a half of each of our prairies every year. And also it's okay to have a patchy burn. You know, on a, you can burn on a, a high humidity day or uh, and, and if some of it doesn't burn, well, you've just added some more refugia. Um, well, Ed, you did uh, provide your email address. Um, okay. And I hope you can we share that in the email we sent tomorrow. I'm sorry if we did not get to your questions. But thank you uh, so much, everyone, for tuning in. And huge thanks to Ed for a really wonderful presentation. So good night, everyone. And uh, look for an email from us tomorrow with some more resources. Thanks again, Ed. Thank you.